Thank you, Elder Plated Hair, for the lovely prayer. As the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Economic Development, today's announcement is meaningful for me and for Alberta's rural economy. In the past year, through engagement sessions, I've been listening to rural Albertans talk about their concerns and challenges when it comes to developing our agricultural economy. In fact, Alberta is home to more Indigenous agricultural operators than anywhere else in Canada. And today's announcement is one more way that we can be sure their operations will continue to grow while their First Nations prosper. With that, I invite Premier Jason Kenney to the podium to make today's announcement. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister Horner. If you don't know, that's uh, Minister Nate Horner, Minister of Agriculture and uh, World of Economic Development. Thank you very much to Elder Plated Hair for opening us in a good way with that beautiful prayer. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Fox Makinima, for welcoming uh, all of the government delegation to your, uh, to the Blackfoot Kainai land here uh, and to uh, Treaty 7 territory. Thanks to all of your councillors and leaders who are joining with us today. I'm joined by, in addition to Minister Horner, by Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations for the Crown in Alberta, uh, the Honourable Rick Wilson, and uh, MLA Joe Scow, the really big guy standing behind me, who's the local representative. Oh, he was behind me. Uh, he was blocking the view. Uh, Joe Scow, who is a hardworking local member of the legislature uh, and the deputy house leader for the government in Alberta's legislature. We're also joined by the chairman of the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, my good friend and fellow Notre Dame hound, uh, Steve Buffalo. Great to see you, Buff and uh, everyone else who is here. Um, you, before I begin, I just want to let, uh, well, Chief Fox knows this, but maybe his counselors don't. I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago uh, to uh, fight for Alberta, uh, to call for an end to the trucker vaccine mandate, uh, but also uh, to get access to American energy markets for our um, world-class energy and to fight against U.S. protectionism. Uh, including in, ag in agricultural products, you'll be happy to know, Nate. And uh, I had about a half an hour open in my schedule. So Makini Ma uh, knows I, I went over to the Smithsonian Museum uh, and uh, one of the greatest museums in the world. And I visited the uh, section of indigenous portraits done by George Catlin, who was the first European origin painter to capture images of the Plains Indians in the early 1800s, including many of the Blackfoot and Blackfeet people. And his most famous portrait uh, hangs there at, at the Smithsonian of Stumakuksuksa. Uh, I hope I didn't get that too wrong. Stumisuksa, uh, chief of uh, Chief Buffalo, Buffalo's back fat, who is Chief Makinima's uh, grandfather to the seventh generation. We managed to get museum quality uh, copies of that portrait and uh, Stumisuksa's wife and, and, and daughter and present those to the Tribal Council last summer when I was last visiting Kainai Forage here. And it was very touching for me, Chief, to be there right in front of that image that was painted with your ancestor. I think almost a, a sacred image for you and your people. And I think I talked the Smithsonian into making a loan for us to bring those paintings here to Alberta so your people can uh, honor this image of your ancestor. But they said only alone. I don't know. I haven't talked them into giving it up altogether. But we'll see. Well, you know, you're persistent, Chief. I know that. And we'll see what we can do. We, we promise not to capture it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a wonderful moment for me to be reminded of, of the magnificent history um, of the uh, blood people, of the Blackfoot people. And um, thank you again for welcoming me here in such a warm way for an important announcement. Before I get to the announcement, I do want to take a moment to recognize all of those who are marching today in memory of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Today's march is a chance to honor the lives of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls across the country. We must recognize and condemn the broad and complex way that Indigenous women have been too often stripped of their rights silenced and devalued. This legacy of trauma, the memories, experiences, and lives of these women and girls must be enshrined in our national consciousness. 
the power of the past is that it reminds us to find a better future. And I hope that everyone involved in the march uh, is filled with hope and determination for future change. Uh, I know this is something that Minister Wilson, his department, and the Alberta Joint Working Group on Missing and Murdered uh, Indigenous Women and Girls are busy working on. We're all committed to finding ways to make Alberta safer, especially for Indigenous women who have too often been vulnerable and who face a disproportionate level of violence. So I believe Minister Wilson has received their final report and it's currently being reviewed so we can get a better understanding of how we, as Albertans, can uh, respond to this tragedy and prevent it in the future. Alberta will continue to grow into a place where Indigenous women and girls are valued, respected, and safe, res uh, respecting their inviolable dignity. Together, we'll make a better tomorrow. And I hope today's uh, announcement that I'm about to get to echoes the principle of a partnership of the spirit of reconciliation and the spirit of the treaties uh, with the goal of shared prosperity. So I am so proud to be here at uh, Kainai Forage near uh, Lethbridge, the second time I've been here in six months. Kainai Forage operation is an amazing success story that represents some of the best of Indigenous entrepreneurship in Canada. I feel very confident that within a few years, this will be the largest producer and exporter of premium Timothy Hay in the country and maybe the world. After all, Alberta is a leader in agriculture, and Indigenous communities must be a part of that pr prosperity in our growing ag sector. Alberta's uh, government ran on a commitment, we were elected on a promise, to be partners in prosperity with First Nations, and that is why in 2019 we passed a law creating the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, the AIOC. It was the first of its kind. This was really visionary, a concept. Um, and it was a first-of-a-kind corporation in Canada, one that removes barriers to First Nations investment in major natural resource development projects. And the concept was this. First Nations should be able to profit fully from the development of the resources that lie below the ground that has been inhabited by their ancestors for millennia. And yet many First Nations don't have the financial capacity uh, or the balance sheets to uh, profit fully from resource development. And the idea here was to create, through the Alberta Crown Fund, access to capital, a backstop, and financial advice and, and, and technical support that could get you access to commercial rates of credit to get, and to get equity uh, participation in big projects as a game changer for First Nations um, in, their, in their path to move people to prosperity. So since the creation of the corporation, First Nations began investing in commercially viable natural resource projects, resulting in increased viability and opportunities that, uh, to, leverage foster, uh, to, to leverage economic prosperity. In its first two years, the corporation has backed three major projects related to natural resources, worth a total investment of over $160 million dollars. This includes $93 million to the Cascade Power Project near Edson, which is creating a bit of a boom up in Edson. The hotels are all full. People are working hard on that project, and I think there's six First Nations in that consortium. $40 million has gone to eight Indigenous communities in the Wood Buffalo region to finance the Northern Courier Pipeline System, and $27 million to the Frog Lake First Nation to invest in Strathcona Resources Lindbergh Cogeneration Facility. And Frog Lake has been a real leader as well. Uh, in, in progressive investment in resources. And most recently, there was capacity grant funding awarded to the uh, Ermanskin Cree Nation Group of Companies to support the advancement of their energy project, a proposed solar power generation facility to be built on Ermanskin uh, land, reserve land. And I think you, reserve, you represent that area, Rick. You're okay, but there's no conflict of interest. We created, we created the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation with the backstop of a billion dollars and the faith and credit of the Alberta Crown. The goal was to facilitate First Nations ownership, as I've said, in the spirit of reconciliation. And that is why I am so proud to be here on the Kainai Nation uh, to announce that we are adding agriculture, transportation, and telecommunications 
to the sectors that are backed up by this billion dollars in loan guarantees and financing through the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation so that hopefully, if you guys make a good application, perhaps the next phase of expansion of this huge Timothy Hay project will be, will be uh, able to get access to credit and other things I know you're working on, Chief. You and your council, very visionary on the Thebane Poppy project and on irrigation projects and so much more. With today's announcement that we're expanding AIOC to include ag, it means that uh, progressive First Nations leaders in agriculture like you will be able to get the money to make those investments, to get your people to work and to create long-term revenue for your people and the services that they need. So this is exciting. And when I talk about telecommunications, that's going to help with the broadband because our First Nations communities are rural communities and they often have very poor uh, high access to high-speed internet service. To get plugged into the global economy, you've got to have that high-speed internet, and this will help finance that as well. Um, more communities will have the financial backing for projects that will help boost prosperity and investment. Adding ag, transport, and telecom opens possibilities for First Nations that are less involved with natural resources. There's not a lot of oil and gas down here. There's a little bit, but a lot less than up north. And, uh, and this, so Kainai is a good example. Um, especially in rural and remote regions, the challenge of accessing financial support has been a roadblock to social and economic growth. So uh, increased ownership and investment in projects will equals high, larger financial gains. That's more that you can invest back in education and training and into your communities. Um, what's most important is the economic independence that comes with this kind of empowerment. This fund is part of the bigger effort to pursue reconciliation. That was, I think, a term that Chief Fox came up with. <laughs> Through practical measures that make real change happen, uh, expanding the AIOC mandate will contribute to Alberta. By the way, this is not just good for First Nations. It's good for the whole province. It's, um, First Nations are getting ahead. The whole province is getting ahead. So I look forward to seeing the projects at, as they get off the ground with the support of AIOC. Uh, now, today's announcement is not that we're backstopping uh, your Kainai uh, Hay project yet. You guys have got to make a good application, but you're standing next to the chairman, and I think he's going to receive your application pretty favorably. So uh, on that happy note, I'm going to invite our brilliant, hardworking Minister of Indigenous Relations, the Honourable uh, Rick Wilson, to come to the podium. Thank you very much. I got my AIOC mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Premier, for that great introduction. And I think we really, the Premier doesn't get enough credit for all that he does, but uh, this was his brainchild. I'm, I get the glory for it, but I, I got to give him full credit. Uh, and, and thank you, Premier, for, for always supporting us. And uh, I come up with crazy ideas and uh, to bounce them off him and he always great support and I just I thank you so much for that it means so much to the indigenous people that you have such a heart for them thank you for that thank you elder plated here for the for the beautiful prayer it's always nice to start off on a start the day off on a on a prayer thank you so much for that minister horner I, I invited mr horner i says uh, uh we're, we're, we're putting some money into agriculture and he got all excited he says well you better come with me and we'll we'll share this together so i'm looking forward to doing some great great things with your with the agricultural community uh also uh stephen buffalo always a always a pleasure to have you with us thank you much and uh, thank you so much for taking on the role of chair that uh, you're going to do an amazing job there and i i asked for help and he jumped right in so thank thank you so much for doing that uh, also, uh, MLA Scow, uh, a lot of people mix us up, uh, but uh, it's nice to see you here today. <laughs> I think it's our good luck, so I'm not sure. <laughs> also, uh, Chief, uh, thank you so much. It's always an honor to come down to your, to your land, and we're driving through here and just uh, looking out at the eastern slopes and the beauty that's here. Thank you so much for inviting us down here. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. As the Premier has said, uh, expanding the AOC mandate is one more way to increase our economic opportunities for Indigenous people so that we can be partners in prosperity. And it opened doors to new relationships with new partners and now new investment in new business ventures. In the last few years, I've seen Indigenous communities partner with a variety of Alberta businesses 
And I believe the AOC's loan guarantees have been a springboard for some of this business growth. And as the Premier gave great examples of those projects, like the, the Cascade Power Project, uh, I was out there last fall, boots on the ground, taking a look around, and that's a massive project. I didn't realize how big it was till I get out there and take a look around. And one Indigenous girl come up to me, and uh, she was so proud that she was part of Alberta's prosperity coming back. She was uh, her first year of apprenticing as, uh, as an electrician, and I thought to myself, that's what this is all about right there. That was, it was beautiful. These kind of business relationships fuel Alberta's economy. They create jobs and diversify our province for a su successful and sustainable future. Like the Premier had said, a lot of up north, you know, you've got oil and gas, and always the chiefs down here are telling me, we don't have a lot of oil and gas, but we've got uh, wind and we've got water, and we've got forage. And I've heard you. I've heard you say that. And so that's why this expansion is happening. It's, it's because we listen to the Indigenous people and, and have helped them in ways that, uh, where they want to help. So now this new expanded mandate, there are going to be even more chances for Indigenous-owned businesses to find new partners and invest in companies and generate wealth. So the Premier talked about reconciliation. That was actually Chief, uh, uh, past Grand Chief Willie Littlechild that coined that phrase. He, he told me about uh, minister, he says the other governments there, they do a lot of uh, symbolism, he says, but I want you to give me action. Reconciliation. And so that's what we're doing. So I, I love that term. It's about giving greater economic participation and opportunity. And I encourage Alberta businesses to create partnerships with Indigenous-owned businesses. It's a great opportunity. And we have a lot of businesses coming to our office all the time looking how they can partner with Indigenous people. Indigenous companies have access to capital. They're innovative, innovative and bring unique perspective that span across a variety of key sectors. And they are also the youngest and fastest growing segment of the population, which is vital to Alberta's strong future workforce. These are also some of the reasons that Alberta's government is committed to boosting economic opportunities for Indigenous people throughout Alberta. Like the Premier said, when Indigenous people thrive, Alberta thrives. So let's keep working together, building a strong economy, strong relationships, and to blaze a bright path forward where we can all prosper. Chief, if you'd like to come forward, I'd just uh, like to, if you could give us a few of your words, and uh, thank you so much again, once again. So goffy. <laughs> Good job. Nixo Koalkak. Okay, get one act so much of one Christian Koekak. Nestor Kok Makinima. Okay, take what I say, take him more. Kixo Kwano, Toto, Toxine, ah, Sinna, no six caction. A patrosauka kitchima. Take what I say, take your two, to soak his poke, your two arms or taspum mokics. And Ram Hicksuka, Pier and Ram Hoka, Umuze Boispia, Keston known and Kamuka, Sapi Pumaxin. Okay, out to him, Scopi, and Hak Hot to sit up here, but Nick's guy need a box cheer. I need a box cheer, need that, but came Mr. Pumo back to Akumatopia, Achtoman start boat the Kyosa, Sikhtaxi, the Kipinan and Kamuxi. Mokotox, Kaks, Okemoxi, that boat, the Kiksa, Muxokia, he tap we are Nedaxi, Naxi, Pue Moka, and Dax are peep we. A Moksa comes so, and I come so, just a peep, Toki, and Mukta, Puish be, Ki, Nedax are peep we. Friends, uh, relatives, uh, Premier Kenny your cabinet uh, people that are here, uh, the staff that are here. Of course, our council is here and uh, our workers, some of our workers uh, that keep this uh, operation going are here as well, as well as our partners from Indigenous Capital. Uh, uh, thank you for being here and I also want to welcome my younger brother, uh, Stephen Buffalo, who is the chairman of this new, uh, a new fund that had been created 
of course, you know, we very much appreciate the, uh, the involvement of the Alberta government and the, the new board. Uh, for those of you that uh, perhaps uh, uh, don't know this information, including you, uh, uh, Premier, uh, Stephen is an honorary member of Kanatsu uh, Mitax. Uh, uh, Kanatsu Mitax. Uh, several years ago, his late brother, Utsumi uh, they, uh, they they were able to get permission by the society for Stephen to be an honorary member. Uh, as well, uh, Stephen works with, for me in some other stuff. So, <laughs> so uh, you'll have to forgive me. I, um, I use an old computer, probably the original iPad. I've gotten attached to it, but it conks out quicker than the newer ones. That's what happened. I had my nice words I was going to, I was going to, share with you, but in any event, uh, there's a smaller version of that, and you'll forgive me if I read part of what I'm going to say. Uh, the Ghana Blood Tribe have a long history of being successful agriculturalists. We have developed the largest irrigation project in Canada, the second largest irrigation farm in the world. And we have infrastructure that supports 25,000 acres of irrigated land. So we are in an enviable position in the agricultural value chain. However, for far too long, indigenous communities have been unable to develop their opportunities because of outside barriers and lack of access to capital. With our partners, Indigenous Capital, we were able to overcome the access to capital problem by securing equity capital from Indigenous and accessing debt capital on market terms for Ghana Forage's expansion. However, the debt process took about a year and a half longer than what it would have taken if we're, we're situated off the reserve. <coughs> With the addition of agriculture and other sectors to, the, to AIOC's mandate, I am hopeful that future projects will be able to access debt more easily. So it's a great opportunity, not just for the Ghana Blood Tribe, but other tribes, other nations throughout Alberta, to be able to take advantage of good business opportunities in the agricultural sector uh, than before. The fund, the fund is certainly gonna help in, uh, in, in, in getting better access to capital, as other businesses uh, do. And, uh, and uh, we are thankful uh, that, uh, that you have expanded. You have expanded your mandate to include agriculture as well as other sectors. Uh, by the way, somebody said, uh, I think it was you, Minister Wilson, said, well, you're always talking agriculture. And I've stated that other nations have more oil and gas than us. Not true, my friend. We are the second biggest oil and gas producer on any Indian reserve in Canada. So we, we built that up as well with the help of, of Stephen. And so anyways, uh, you know, we like to just state the obvious sometimes. We're not bragging, not bragging, and we're not arrogant. Some say we're arrogant, you know, that's the case. But we need to work together with industry with the help, with the good help of, uh, of Premier Kenny, his cabinet, and the Alberta government we are making much headway, much headway into various sectors. And this fund, this opportunities fund, is really going to create that much more incentive. It is going to progress some of the good business opportunities that, that, that lay before us. Premier Kenny, you mentioned uh, it is important for tribes and nations to be able to uh, have own source revenue. 
through profits and, 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 and through hard work. Well, that has been our belief for some time. Uh, other tribes, nations uh, talk about sovereignty, which is good. It's good, especially our cousins in the States. And, uh, but in order to really attain true sovereignty as a government representing a tribe or a people, you have to have financial sovereignty. So important. And this is what this fund is going to help create. So thank you. Uh, for listening to me. I lost uh, my train of thought because I lost my, the words I was going to share with you. Hopefully, what I've come up um, is, is, uh, is informative enough. Uh, I want to thank our council, uh, our, our staff. I want to thank our, our operators. Uh, they make this um, operation run. I want to thank our partners, um, Indigenous Capital, uh, for becoming involved and really uh, giving us the opportunity to really expand, you know. Uh, we've always, uh, we always uh, have worked well with indigenous capital, not just in the agricultural sector, but in the oil and gas and other sectors. And soon, Premier and Steve, Chairman, will be coming to you to really, really expand our, uh, our alternative energy projects. And uh, Premier Wilson said, uh, we have a lot of wind down here. Well, yeah, we have a lot of wind, you know, but the folks up north have a lot of hot air. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, with that, uh, with that, I don't want to spend too much time talking. Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, wonderful news, Premier. We appreciate the good work that you have done. You've really, I think, supported the Blood Tribe in other initiatives, such as in education and combating the um, combating the, um, the, uh, the the drug abuse problem that many Albertans, uh, you know, unfortunately suffer. And so we're trying our best. Uh, I think we're working well uh, together. And um, I want to introduce uh, my uh, <coughs> my good friend my good friend Stephen Buffalo. Uh, Stephen's father, uh, Chief Victor Buffalo, and I have known each other for a long time. And uh, we, uh, we have worked together on some other matters. And it was, it was good that you have uh, selected uh, Steve to be on the board. Uh, I think you asked me first, though, if I wanted to be on the board. I told her, no, I don't want to jeopardize our opportunities to, to get money from the funds. So, so in any event, uh, um, uh, Stephen has uh, been involved in, uh, in the energy sector uh, for some time, as well as in the banking, in the banking uh, sector, and uh, very traditional, and uh, uh, he um, has many uh, uh, traditional relatives. Uh, with our nation, our tribe. With that, um, I want to introduce uh, Stephen Buffalo, the chairman of the board. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, I think we we're told to do this, so I better follow <laughs> the instructions. Hunt, let's go. All the notes that I had prepared were already said. <laughs> Thank you, Chief McKinema. Thank you, Premier, for your commitment, creating these opportunities for Indigenous communities in this province through expanding our mandate and the work and potential that we can do through the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. I want to thank the Elder for the prayer, Minister Horner, and acknowledge uh, Minister Wilson for his continued support for the AIOC. My name is Stephen Buffalo. I'm the chairman of the board of the Alberta Indigenous Opportunity Opportunities Corporation, a position I, I'm proud and find myself in because how closely your organization's mandates aligns with my personal mission and support to champion Indigenous prosperity across our province. 
When the AIOC was first created in 2019, the organization's initial mandate was to increase the access to capital for Indigenous groups to get involved in Alberta's natural resource sector, barring AIOC from providing any financial supports for projects that fell outside the natural resource sector. Today, we're very proud to announce this mandate is expanding and it speaks to the strength of the organization and the capacity and interest of our indigenous, indigenous communities to invest in the province. As announced, the expansion of the mandate to include agriculture, telecommunication, transportation, and related infrastructure will allow appropriate sized projects, which begin at 20 million in capital for eligible AIOC supports. Promoting this participation from indigenous community partners will result in increased ownership opportunities for these communities, along with a stronger, more resilient economy for First Nations and our province of Alberta. These sectors are industry that many Indigenous communities have vested interests in expanding and further strengthening and improving the well-being and economic success of their communities. By supporting First Nation and Métis communities in accessing funding, investing in greater range of major projects, Many Indigenous communities will continue to prosper. To date, the AIOC backstopped $160 million in loan guarantees to support Indigenous investment in three major natural resource projects in Alberta. $93 million to a group of six First Nations for the Cascade Power Project. $40 million to the eight Indigenous communities in Wood Buffalo region to finance the Northern Courier Pipeline System. 27 million to Frog Lake First Nation to invest in the Strathcona Resource Lindbergh cogeneration facility. The expanded mandate illustrates our organization's strength and stability to continue to support the health and well-being of our communities. And we look forward to continuing to work alongside indigenous groups here in Alberta as we aim to create more, a more equitable economy for all. I would like to thank you for your time today, for your interest to this exciting update from the AIOC, and we are eager to begin reviewing project proposals that include projects in these new sectors, and look forward to sharing them with you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and that, with that, that concludes our, our formal remarks for today. And we'll now turn things over to the moderator uh, to take a few questions from the media. Thank you, Minister Horner. Uh, just a reminder to any of our media folks assembled here in person, there is a uh, Unimic behind you to ask questions just so folks on the live stream can hear. And I'd ask you to please introduce yourself and your outlet prior to asking a question, as well as directing your question to who you'd like to ask it to. And with that, we'll uh, open questions from the floor before moving to the phones. Seeing no questions from the floor, I will ask our operator, please connect our first caller. Thank you. Our first caller is James Keller, Globe and Mail. Hi, Premier. I'm just wondering uh, a question about the emergency uh, declaration from the federal government today. I mean, you had already said that you don't think uh, you need this, or, nor do you want this uh, in place in Alberta, although the Prime Minister is pretty clear that it applies everywhere. So what do you think about the the move today and how do you think it might affect this province? Well, I don't think it will affect us very much because, as I've said, Alberta has the legal tools and the operational resources we need to ensure law and order. I know the uh, blockade at Coots has been frustrating, has gone on for too long, but to today we were able to reveal why there's been a relatively light touch on enforcement for much of that period. It's due to the investigation uh, that was undertaken uh, regarding this uh, potentially violent cell and uh, the RCMP's need to prepare its uh, tactical operation uh, to remove that uh, potential violent threat before they could proceed with more conventional enforcement against the blockade. Now that, we have re now that the RCMP has resolved that uh, in a safe and secure way, now that we have obtained, uh, the province has obtained the necessary heavy equipment uh, to move rigs and commercial vehicles off the road, uh, the police can now move and intend to move uh, to enforcement action. 
Um, I conveyed to the Prime Minister this morning my view that um, this is a very uh, sensitive time and that any measures that could further inflame tensions uh, could be counterproductive. That's our read of the situation in Alberta. I can't speak to what's going on in other parts of the country. I do know several other premiers have spoken out against the uh, assess, assessing the uh, invocation of the Federal uh, Emergencies Act as being imprudent at this time, and that's certainly our point of view from Alberta. And James, do you have a follow-up today? I do. So are you concerned that this might uh, give, or that there might be additional powers that the federal government or federal agencies, you know, whether it's CBSA or RCP or whoever, uh, might use these powers in Alberta, you know, essentially over the province's objections? Well, that would be one concern for sure, which is that uh, uh, provinces under our constitution are responsible for law enforcement, and um, we are perfectly capable of uh, doing that. Uh, and I, I am concerned about what the implications of this are, the precedent that it might set. And that was a concern I know shared by a number of my colleagues uh, this morning. Uh, but um, I think really right now, the Prime Minister can play a role in turning down the temperature. He can indicate that he's working with the Biden administration to lift this pointless uh, cross-border trucker vaccine mandate. It serves no useful public health purpose in a continent with tens of millions of active COVID infections, telling a few thousand unvaccinated truckers who could be asked to take a, a rapid test um, that uh, they could somehow constitute a public health menace uh, is ridiculous. These are folks that work in, by definition, in isolation in their cabs. Um, this was brought in just as, as most co many countries and, and uh, states and provinces began repealing public health restrictions. It made no sense except as political theater. And then the prime minister's ad added fuel to the fire um, with his uh, with his defamatory and derogatory words uh, co covering all of these protesters with the same extremist brush. Um, and I, I think that uh, where, where we'd like to see federal leadership is in turning down the temperature, de-escalating the situation, getting out of this pointless trucker vax mandate, um, and uh, and sh and uh, not giving in to uh, illegal blockades, but coming back to a defensible public health policy on these issues. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please connect our next call? Thank you, Graham Thompson, iPolitics. Thank you. Um, I'm going to apologize. As reports were doing this morning, um, Premier, you know, we haven't been asking questions about the topic of the day or the news conference. A lot is happening, as you know, events are happening. But looking at the um, the Coots blockade, you're saying the RCMP will be moving in um, more aggressively now, perhaps to, perhaps more aggressively. Do you have a timeline? Like, how soon do you want to see this blockade over and the border opened up? I, I would like to have seen it over two weeks ago, but um, there were operational challenges. First, the RCMP had tried to get some cooperation and that happened intermittently. Um, we didn't have heavy equipment, as you know, here and elsewhere. Uh, protest supporters have intimidated uh, tow truck vendors. And, uh, and so uh, essentially the RCMP wasn't able to get equipment. We got to work as a province and that now have secured that. And then we, we lost several days uh, as, uh, for conventional enforcement as they had to um, avoid any provocation that could have triggered this uh, potential violent cell. They needed to collect their intelligence, evidence, and plan their tactical operation uh, this morning. So um, in speaking to De Deputy Commissioner Zablocki this morning, uh, I have the impression that they, uh, the, the, the RCMP would like to move forward uh, with enforcement uh, I I in the very near future. I'm not going to put an hour uh, on that because obviously it's a matter, that's a sensitive operational matter. Um, they've also had a lot of people working around the clock on the uh, on uh, this morning's enforcement matter. But uh, I have the very clear impression they intend to move forward quickly and robustly to bring order to Coots and the surrounding area. And Graham, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, I do. Speaking of quickly and uh, moving quickly, um, you have until tomorrow, I believe, to call the Fort McMurray Lac La Biche uh, by-election. When will we see you call that by-election? And what do you think of um, your UCP candidate, Ron well, Jean? Yeah, obviously uh, there's a legal uh, requirement, and we'll be respecting that, of course. 
we wanted we didn't want to call a by-election while we were still in the midst of the COVID peak uh, for Omicron, the fifth wave. So we thought it would be uh, difficult uh, to, for, for local candidates of all parties to campaign in that environment. Uh, but uh, so having held it late is a way that we can ensure that the campaign ensues uh, as we are coming down uh, in terms of COVID numbers and hospital pressures. Uh, and so uh, just stay tuned for that news. And I want to join with you, Graham, in, in actually apologizing to the chief that we're taking non Non uh, question, questions not related to the topic today, but that's how it rolls. You understand that. Uh, thanks, Premier. I just want to open the uh, the floor up one more time to see if any of our local reporters have a question before moving to our last call. And once again, seeing none, operator, can you please connect our last call of the day? Thank you, Nasima Way, Radio Canada. Hello, uh, bonjour. J'aimerais poser une question en français, si c'est possible. Vous m'entendez? Oui, je vous entends. OK. Alors, euh, j'aimerais savoir... C'est euh, toujours sur Coute, en fait. Euh, vous avez okay. un problème? Alors, est-ce que vous avez les détails sur la loi sur les mesures d'urgence qui vont être posées? Okay. Non, euh, effectivement... Euh, on a eu une discussion générale avec le premier ministre euh, aujourd'hui, ce matin. Euh, ils, ont, ils, ont, euh, mis, euh, ils ont suggéré quelques points, mais ce n'était pas, pas en plein explicite. Alors, euh, je n'ai pas eu un briefing de, de, de gouvernement fédéral euh, à cet égard. Euh, mais écoutez, nous croyons que ce n'est pas nécessaire. En Alberta, nous avons tous les pouvoirs nécessaires au plan légal, toutes les ressources opérationnelles, comme nous avons vu ce matin avec les opérations importantes du GRC. Et euh, alors, euh, nous croyons que euh, l'invocation euh, de la loi sur les urgences canadiennes est une étape très tendue euh, dans une situation difficile nous ne voulons pas amplifier les voix, euh, comme j'ai dit, les, les, les émotions tendues actuellement. Alors, je crois que ce n'est pas prudent. Au moins, je, je parle de la pers du perspective de l'Alberta. Peut-être qu'il y a d'autres choses à Ottawa, mais pour nous autres, ce n'est pas nécessaire. And Nazima, before I get you your yeah. follow-up, if you have a uh, audio device playing anything in the background, can you please make sure that's on mute? We're just hearing some extra feedback oh, from yeah, your end. Oh, yeah, for sure. Sorry about that. Okay. So, la GRC s'inquiète d'une escalade de la violence à Kout. Uh, Qu'en pensez-vous que la situation va, va aller là-bas, que ça va se normaliser là-bas? Oui, c'est très grave. Et j'aimerais uh, saluer et remercier le GRC de leur uh, action Uh, très professionnel. Ils ont appris uh, la semaine dernière uh, de renseignements d'un uh, petit groupe des manifesta manifestants qui a eu uh, évidemment l'intention violente et qui ont eu une cache des armes à feu. Uh, et alors, uh, ce matin, après, pl après plusieurs jours de planification, le, GR le GRC a effectué les arrestations de plusieurs de ces gens-là euh, euh, qui ont été impliqués dans le, cette, euh, ce groupe militant et ils ont saisi euh, plusieurs armes, armes euh, euh, et alors une cache d'armes. Euh, euh, comme j'ai dit, je, je suis très heureux que tout ça se déroulait sans violence euh, et maintenant, le GRC a l'intention, avec l'appui total de la province, à lancer l'enforcement contre le, le blocage, les manifestations illégales euh, sur les frontières et les autoroutes. Euh, euh, évidemment, les détails opérationnels, c'est une question pour les policiers, mais je les souhaite la bonne chance. J'ai un message pour tous les manifest manifestants là-bas, puis ils ont envoyé leur message politique, mais c'est la fin. Il faut renvoyer chez eux. Il faut mettre fin à toute cette folie-là. Puis s'ils ont les messages à transmettre, euh, faites ça dans une façon pacifique et légale. Merci, folks. That wraps things up today. Thank you.